this morning, um, we're going to continue in our series of what the Holy Spirit gave us earlier this year, um, EMC, the body edition, EMC, the body edition. Um, and it's, it's powerful to me that it just so happens <laughs> that we are all home folks here. So um, I believe that's on purpose and by design. I don't believe that God does anything by accident. And so we're just going to talk about family business this morning. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's start there, and then we'll push forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, and that whole chapter is good, but we're not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time. We're actually just going to read, we're going to start at verse 12, then we're going to skip down a few verses. But let's start at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Father, we honor you and thank you for your word. God, grant us truth this morning so that we can be made free. We rebuke rebellion and distraction and any other attacks of the enemy. Grant us truth, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, and bring your anointing to this place that makes teaching easy and applying the teaching a sweet delight. We will not be forgetful hearers of the word, but we will be doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The Bible says this, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, now listen to the verbiage here that Paul uses. He says, so also, he did not say so also is Jesus. He says, so also is who? Christ. And who is Christ? And you can go ahead and write this down in your notes if you did not know it. Christ equals the anointing. So in order for our church to flow in the anointing or flow under the capacity and the function of the vision of the set prelates of this house, we've got to understand that we are many members, but we are one body. Amen. Let's start there. That if you call Evangelistic Ministries Church, your church home, you are not in this by yourself. And you say, well, Brother Henry, I feel like I'm in this by myself. Well, if you feel like you're in this by yourself, please understand that that is a trick of the devil. That the enemy knows that when God was creating his creation, he said, light, that's good. He said, firmament, that's good. He said, separate the waters, that's good. He said, animals, that's good. The first time that God said it is not good in the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, you can cross-reference it so that you can make sure that my quotation is correct. He said, it is not good that man is alone. And so the first trick of the enemy is that he wants to get you isolated and by yourself. But Paul says here, he says, just like the body is one with many members, so is Christ or the anointing or his church is one with many members. Let's skip down to verse 25. It says this, that there should be no schism in the body, no separation in the body, amen, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Could it be that the reason why people in our church feel so isolated is because they don't sense the care that we have one for another? Did you know that care was a command? So if you're mean, just repent. Amen. Bible says this, it says, verse 26, and where the one member suffer, what happens? All the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so listen, when <laughs> just, just yesterday, y'all, I was in my kitchen, and um, we were, I was doing some chores around the house, and y'all, I turned around, and I hit my foot on the corner of the counter. Jesus. And it's amazing how I hit my pinky toe on the corner of the counter as I was walking, because I was just walking absentmindedly throughout my house, and y'all, there was a vein that popped up in my forehead. 
hit my toe down here, but felt the repercussion up here. Why? Because it's all one body, right? And so, y'all, empathy is when we um, feel the, the stress and the strain of somebody, somebody else's issue, right? Where we might not necessarily be going through something, but because we are part of one body, it's as if we are going through it together. This is where intercession is so powerful. Why? Because intercession is not me praying for someone. Watch this now. It's me praying as someone. So the Bible, when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God and he's making intercession for us, he is not making intercession for us saying, God bless um, Brother Henry. He's saying, no, God bless me because I am going through, because I am dealing with this situation. He's praying as if he were me. Why? Because we are all part of the same body. It says if we suffer, one, one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers, y'all. We all feel it. Amen. Bible says this, but, but if one be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So that casts out the spirit of haterade right there. Why is it that she get blessed, but, 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 and I know what she going through, and I know what he do, and this, that, and the third, but listen, even if you got dirt on one of your fellow family members, if they are blessed, guess what? We're all part of the same body, so we rejoice with them. Look what it says here. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? Uh-uh. Do all speak with tongues? Nope. Do all interpret? Uh-uh. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And so, y'all, we got to make sure that the body is in alignment. And so this morning, I want you to write this down as a thought, and um, we'll, we'll, call her, we'll call her a prophetess because she, she pulled this out on Wednesday night, and I was like, stop talking because I'm, I'm going to talk about this some more Sunday. We're going to call Prophetess Mullen to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the stand and say, the plug, part two. The plug, part two. Because as you know, we talked about the plug um, a couple of months back, but God put some more stank on it. So I'm like, okay, God, let's, let's do this in Jesus' name. Now, um, here we go. So the plug. And, and I don't know who was here a couple of months back when, when we talked about the plug, but I understand street vernacular, right? When you hear the term the plug, you're like, hold up, Brother Henry, what you talking about when you talking about the plug, okay? Now, I know about a plug when I plug in electricity. I understand that plug, but what about this street slang or this vernacular? Well, the, a plug, a person who is a plug is someone who is a resource for obtaining something valuable, okay? That would otherwise be difficult to obtain, okay? So the plug has access to something that is valuable. They can obtain something valuable that for everyone else, it is difficult for them to obtain, okay? That's number one. Number two, a plug is someone who has access to things and sells them for a low price, okay? So there are two definitions of a plug. First, it's the person who has access to stuff that otherwise would be difficult for other people to obtain. And they also, since they have access to this stuff, they're able to sell these things for a low price because they got the hookup, basically. All right? Now, now check this out. Who in here has ever heard of um, a gospel artist named Todd Dulaney? Anybody ever heard of Todd Dulaney? Raise your hand if you've heard of Todd Dulaney. Okay. All right. So Todd Anthony Dulaney... He's an American gospel musician and a former baseball player. His music career started in 2011 with the release of the CD version, Pulling Me Through. This would be his breakthrough released upon the gospel billboard album charts, and he would release another album, A Worshipper's Heart, in 2016 with Entertainment One in Nashville. And this would place 
even higher on the gospel album charts. He was athletic as a youth playing sports, in particular baseball, where he would play at a local community college, getting drafted by the New York Mets in 2002, and even drafted as a 32nd round selection. He never reached the major leagues, but played a short stint of his professional career in the minors. He decided after 2005 to retire from the sport because he felt God's call to play gospel music, which he did under the tutelage of an artist that many of us have heard of from Pine Bluff named Smokey Norful. Who's heard of Smokey Norful, okay? Who asked him to tour with him. Now, Todd Dulaney has hits like Your Great Name and Doing It All Again and albums that have reached number one on the Billboard music charts and numerous Grammy and Stellar Award nominations. Todd Dulaney is proof that God can use anyone for his glory and others good. And so a couple of months ago, I did not know that when Todd Dulaney came to Arkansas to a church in Little Rock, that it would open me up to uh, a plug. And so I was sitting having dinner with someone having a dinner meeting, and I heard that Todd Dulaney was going to be coming to town, and I like Todd Dulaney's music. A lot of times over in the fellowship hall with our children, we play his music because we play YouTube videos for praise and worship, and we be playing it, doing it all again. We like, we doing it all again. Da -da 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 -da. I'm like, man, I would love to hear this live. And y'all, I heard that um, Todd Dulaney was coming to town to a local church in Little Rock, and the ticket sold out. Ticket sold out, and I said, man, I'm a Todd Dulaney, right here in my backyard, close to my hometown, and I can't even get into the building. Well, I was sitting down having dinner, and the person that I was having dinner with said, you know what, I think I might know somebody that knows somebody that could get you into the concert. Let me make some phone calls. And I said, okay, so I was sitting there at dinner. This was a Tuesday night, I believe, and the, the concert was on a Friday night. I said, okay, I'm not going to get my hopes up because, you know, once I get my hopes up, if it doesn't come through, then I'm going to be disappointed. And so Wednesday go by, didn't hear any word. Thursday goes by, didn't hear any word. Friday comes, it's the day of the concert. And so I text the person who said they was going to hook me up, and they was like, I still haven't heard word. Let me, let me try again. And so we get to all the way down to the concert starts at 7 o'clock. We get to about 642. And I still hadn't heard any word from my source that said, you can go ahead and go to this concert that had been sold out. And so y'all, my family and I, we go on, out to eat on Friday nights to spend some time with, spend some family time. And so I said, well, I guess we'll just spend some family time. And so we went out to eat. And y'all, at a little bit after 7 o'clock, my plug came through. My cell phone buzzed, and I looked at my cell phone real quick. He said, go ahead and go to the church and ask for this particular guy's name. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go up here asking for this dude's name. And I'm like, okay, he ain't going to know who I am. And so I go to the church. My wife drops me off, and I go in, and we'll just say the, the young man's name is Derek. And I say, hey, because um, they, they got people sitting there, right, to receive a ticket or money to pay for the ticket, right? But the tickets are sold out, so... There, I need to have a ticket in my hand. And so I'm sitting there, the people looking at me, and I said, uh, I don't have no ticket, but uh, is Derek around? And they had this confused look on their face. And I'm thinking, man, my plug didn't come through. <laughs> they said, well, yeah, Derek, Derek happens to be right there. Just so happened that Derek was in the foyer at the time that I walked up. And so I said, okay, I got through round one, the ticket folks, because they don't know who I am. And so we get, to, we get to Derek, and Derek doesn't know who I am. And I look at Derek, and I say, hey, Derek, um, um, my friend here told me to ask for you to get me into the concert. Now, Derek, y'all, is about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, now, I'm 6'2". I'm a pretty tall guy, but this guy's taller than me. I weigh over 200 pounds, but this guy's bigger than me. And so I'm like, uh, Mr. Derek, uh, uh, my friend said that you, would, you could get me into the concert. And Derek looked me up and down. And he said, come on in. And I was like, God, my plug came through. And so I got a chance to do it all again. And I got a chance to call on the name of Jesus. And I got a chance to go to a phenomenal concert because my plug came through. Y'all, guess who my plug was? 
<laughs> yeah, Jesus is the plug. We're going to get there in a minute. But my plug was somebody that goes to our church by the name of Sister Alexandria Washington. Give God praise for Sister Alexandria Washington and her connections to the plug. And so there's a story in the Bible that illuminates or highlights the story that I just gave you in my own personal life. If we go to John chapter 4, I want to show this to you. John chapter 4. I want you to see this here. John chapter 4. And if you look at verse number 5, I want you to see this. The Bible says this. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria. Now he is Jesus, right? And like somebody said earlier, Jesus is our plug. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And I sense in the spirit realm that there are some people in this room who feel a lot like Jesus, weary from the journey. Amen? So the Bible says that Jesus was tired, and he sits down at this well, and it's the sixth hour, and this sixth hour is about noontime. It's about 12 o'clock noon. So I don't want you to think that it's 6 o'clock in the morning. It's actually 12 o'clock noon, in Samaria, y'all, Samaria is one of the hottest, driest places on the planet. So it's hot, he's tired, it's noontime, the hottest part of the day. And the Bible says that he sat down at the well. And here we go. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat. His disciples went to the city to buy meat. But Jesus was not hungry. Jesus was thirsty. And isn't it frustrating when you know you have a specific need in your life and people are going and they say, well, I got you this and I got you that and I did this and I did that, but that's not what I needed. And so Jesus here is sitting down at a well, he's thirsty, he's tired, and his disciples are gone to buy food and not give him anything to drink. Are you with me? And he's at the well by himself, right? Anybody ever been there where you, where you are, you, you have such a, a, a specific and, and dire need in your life and you feel like you're all alone, like nobody can relate to you or connect to you. But here it is right here. The Bible says in verse number seven, there came a woman from Samaria to draw what? Water. And Jesus said to her, give me to drink. Okay. His disciples, who are his homies, went to get food, and he sees this woman from Samaria, and he asks her, or makes a request of her, to give him something to drink. Now watch this. Verse number 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to unpack here because these specific verses are quite loaded. Listen, first thing I want you to write down is I want you to see the plug. Write that down. See the plug. S-E-E, -E, the plug. I want you to see the plug. Because Jesus is the plug. But I want to unpack a couple of things here in this particular verse. First of all, 
there are three things at play here. Number one, as far as socially or culturally, Jews and Samaritans don't get along. All right? They don't get along. Jews don't like Samaritans, and Samaritans don't like Jews. That's number one. Number two, this specific woman came to the well, and she's a woman. And women did not converse with men publicly back in these times. So we have a cultural bias here. Then we also have a gender bias here, right? And number three, this particular woman, the reason why she came to the well at the hottest part of the day when all the other women came to the well in the morning when it was cooler and the weather wasn't as contrary is because the woman is a social outcast. She has a reputation. And so she would do this practice every single day. And every single day she would come to the well at a specific time and no one would be there. This is part of her duty. This is part of her ritual. This is part of her routine. And, and, and she, she would come, she would get her water, and nobody would say anything to her, and she would go back to the crib and do whatever she wanted to do with the rest of her day. But on this specific day, she went to do something that she always did, and she met the plug. She met Jesus. And I'm going to submit to you this morning, beloved, in the name of Jesus Christ, that in 2020, as we wrap up 2019 and go into 2020, the thing that you thought was mundane, the thing that you thought was a ritual, the thing that you really didn't want to do, I'm speaking by faith that when you do that thing, that when you do it, you're going to meet Jesus. Glory be to God, I thank you. You're going to meet Jesus. And it's not going to matter what your specific hang-up is, what society has said about you, what society calls you, whether or not you're a social outcast, or where you know the statistics say what happens to people who are born to single, single mothers. You know what the statistics say when people can't read. You know what society says about certain folk. I believe by faith in Jesus' name that those of you, when you get to that well, you're going to meet the maker. You're going to meet the plug, you're going to connect with Jesus himself. He says, give me something to drink. And the first thing that she said was something that society had to deal with. When you're face to face with Jesus, the last thing that you need to talk about is what society feels is okay. She's sitting there face to face with the very person who can get her out of her situation and the first thing that she says is, hold up, what a minute. What you talking to me for? Jews don't have no dealings with us. And you're a rabbi. You're, you're, you're a man of God. You're not supposed to be talking to me in public. But listen to how Jesus responded. He said, if you knew who it was that was asking you to give them something to drink. He, matter of fact, he said, if you knew the gift of God, glory be to God, then you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. When you see the plug, I want this to raise your awareness. Write that word down. I want this to raise your awareness. Now watch this here. I want this to raise your awareness. When you are aware, you are informed, alert, knowledgeable, and sophisticated. I want you to, in 2020 and beyond, I want you to understand and see what has been available to you the whole time. Because there are too many believers, y'all, in this room who are living beneath their real potential. We're living beneath what we could actually be. And I'm talking about as individuals and I'm talking about as a church. We're be living beneath who we really are. The first thing that we need to do is raise our awareness. Lord, let me see. Glory be to God. 
Help me be informed, God. And when I get the information, help me be alert. And when I'm alert, God, help me be knowledgeable and help me apply it to the point where I can be sophisticated. When I see the plug, that raises my awareness. Now, we're going to skip down here. We're going to skip down a little bit. I want to show you something else here in this particular story. Let's skip down because the whole story is good, but I can't read the whole chapter to you. So let's go down to verse, verses 25 through 30. Let's skip down to verses 25 through 30. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Here it is. Raise my awareness, Lord. He had to break it all the way down to her. I who speak unto you, that's, that's me. I'm Messiah. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went to the city and said to the men. Now, I actually, I actually went to the wrong verse. Let's go to 15 first. You with me? All right, the Bible says this. The woman said unto her, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said unto her, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast, five husb hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In, in that says thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, the second thing I want you to do after you see the plug, and it raises your awareness, I want you to free the plug. Write that down, free the plug. I want you to free the plug, and this right here, when you free the plug, it allows you to access so when I see the plug, it raises my awareness. In other words, I can see, right? I'm informed, I'm knowledgeable, I'm sophisticated. Now, the second thing I want you to do is free the plug, and this raises my access, or this allows me to have access to what God has for me. Now, here it is right here. Access is the ability, right, or permission to approach. <laughs> Glory be to God to enter, to speak with, or to use. And so it's not enough for me to raise my awareness or to see the plug, but now I need to free the plug. In other words, I need the, to allow the plug to do what it is that the plug needs to do in my life. Because it does no good for me to know who God is if I do not allow God to do what he needs to do in my life, to do what he needs to do in me in order for me to get what God has for me. If I have awareness, now I need to open up my access. Okay? Now, watch this. Listen how Jesus opens up this access. He says to her, I love how Jesus is. He's quite slick with this. He looks at the woman in verse number 16. He says, hey, go call your husband. Go get him. All right? And now I can imagine that the woman, when she said, go call, when, he, when Jesus said, go call your husband, I imagine that the woman's temperature raised. Her blood pressure raised. Her heart started beating because she's having a conversation with somebody at the well when she normally has no one to talk to at the well. And this Jesus here is giving her all kinds of information and opening up her revelation. And, he, and she's like, man, this conversation going pretty good. But then he starts to get into her personal business. <laughs> he starts to go into her front room, her bathroom, and her bedroom. Go call your husband. Right? And she gave one of them little old churchy responses like we do. I don't have a husband. She wanted to give the truth with as little detail as possible. With as little information as possible. She didn't say, uh, I'm shacking. She didn't say, I'm a five-time divorcee. She said, I don't have a husband, right? 
Isn't that what we do when God is getting all in our business? We try to sit, we try to make it to the point where it's like, God, God, I don't really want you to know all of that. I don't want to give you access to the real part of me. I'm going to just give you access to the churchy side. But if I want the plug to be free in my life, to do what the plug wants to do in my life, I've got to do this word. I've got to be vulnerable. And part of the reason why our church, there are people in our church who feel isolated and by themselves is because you have not allowed yourself to be really vulnerable. You come up in here struggling every day, barely can rub two nickels together, but you're going to put this mask on yourself, put this mask on your children, act like everything is hunky-dory and everything is okay when you being tore up on the inside. I declare and decree by the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ that you're going to free the plug in Jesus' name, that you're going to give God access to the innermost parts of you so that God can do what it is that he came to do. When I give access, I give the ability, the right, or permission to approach, enter, speak with, or use. When I give access, that gives me admittance into what it is that I'm trying to get into. Just like I had access to the concert, I was admitted into the concert and I was allowed to experience the concert because I had access. If my plug would have never came through, I would have been on the outside looking in and would have just saw on social media or would have saw or heard it around town how great the concert was. But because I had access, I was able to experience it for myself. And so Jesus, so smooth and so slick, says, you know what? You're right. You've had five husbands, and the man that you're sleeping with now is not your husband. Right? you got five husbands, and you're shacking. In this, you said truly that I have no husband. Then the woman says unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. That part right there is when she allowed Jesus to have access to her life because Jesus was not telling her business just to embarrass her. He was telling her business because he saw something about her situation that she did not even see herself. Now, I want you to write this statement down. There is value in my trial. There is value in my situation. See, Jesus sees situations differently than the way that we see them. See, what we see is a whore. What we see is a person who is promiscuous. What God saw, what Jesus saw in that moment when she gave him access into the innermost parts of her life, what, what Jesus saw was a person who was a people person, who was good at publicly relating, who was a person who could uh, relate with people and have great communication skills. <laughs> See, the very thing that you got in trouble for when you was a kid is probably the very thing that you're getting paid to do now. Guess what I got minuses in every nine weeks on my report card when I was coming up? Can control talking. Now, y'all, when I was in school... I made phenomenal grades. I used to make straight A's. School was so easy. The work that the teachers gave to me was a breeze. I just boom, boom, knock it out. Tests, make hundreds on them, make a 98, whatever. Anytime I miss one problem, I have a temper tantrum. Because I'm like, how did I miss that one, right? But the thing that I struggled with in school was my mouth. And guess what I use every single day now? The very thing I got in trouble for. <laughs> The very thing I got in trouble for in school is the very thing that God used to give me into my purpose in my life. What am I trying to tell you? That yes, I had the gift of gab back then, but until that gift of gab was harnessed in the right direction and pointed in purpose, it was going to do nothing but get me in trouble. It was the same thing with this woman. She had the gift of God on the inside of her, but because she was using it for carnal purposes, it, it, it did nothing but cause devastation in her life. And so Jesus said, yes, you're right. You're a whore. You messed up. You 
jacked up from the back up and toe up from the flow up. But I tell you what, if you give me access, if you free my anointing in your life, I can flip that thing in Jesus' name to the point where the thing that you were ostracized for could be the very thing that caused the purpose of God in your life. Somebody say, free the plug. So we got to see the plug, right? And that raises our awareness. And then we got to free the plug, which allows us access, allows God access into the innermost parts of us. And the final thing I want us to look at, we looked at it a little bit earlier, but I want to go back to it, is verses 25 through 30. I want you to see this here. The woman said unto him, I know that you are Messiah, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou or why are you talking to this woman? Because remember, we got, we got social, we got cultural, and we got gender. We got three roadblocks to this plug, and so the disciples are, are thinking carnally just like society would say, hold up, Jesus, why are you talking to this woman? Look what the Bible says here. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. The final thing that I want you to do, and then I'm going to be out your way, is I want you to free the plug. Write that down. No, not free the plug. I want you to see the plug. I want you to free the plug. And the last thing I want you to do is I want you to be the plug. Write that down. I want you to be the plug. And this is where we get stuck in our Christianity is because there are people in this room who see the plug, which raises their awareness. And there are people in this room who free the plug, which raises access. But there are not enough people in this room who are actually the plug, which raises their ability. Write that word down, ability. Because, see, there is a process to allowing the plug to do what he's called to do in your life. I want your awareness to be raised, and I want your access. I want you to give God access to him, and I want, you to, I, want, I want you to give God access to your heart, and I want you to have access to him, but I also want you to walk in your ability. So when I see the plug, when I free the plug, now I finally must be the plug. And I'm believing by faith that we are going to be a church where everybody in the body is a plug in some form. Glory be to God. Where we're not just coming here looking what God can do for us, but we can come here looking what we can do for God. Glory be to God. We're not looking for a handout because we got our hands up. Hallelujah. We're not looking at this person and that person saying, what, what's their problem or what it is that they're going through? But how can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I be of some assistance? Can I give you a smile? Can I give you a hug? Can I worship God? Can I sweep the floor? Can I vacuum the floor? Can I clean the toilet? Can I pour the drink? Can I be an usher? Can I preach the sermon? Can I sing the song? Can I push the button? Can I turn on the lights? Can I fix the vans? What is it that I can do to be a plug in somebody else's life so that I can have the ability that God has for me? Glory be to God. Somebody say, see the plug. Somebody say, free the plug. Somebody say, be the plug. Somebody say, access, awareness, ability. Now, here it is right here. Your ability is your power or your capacity to do. Did you hear that? Your ability is your power or your capacity to do or to act physically, mentally, legally, morally, financially, etc. It's not enough. For us to come in here week after week and say, God, I want to see you. I want to see you, God. 2020 vision, I want to see God. Y'all know that's going to be the church's mantra in 2020, right? Vision, right? Vision, 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 2020. Perfect sight, perfect sight. Yeah, see God, see the plug. Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, I see. But when are you going to free?
Because what do you do after you see God? <laughs> Bible says this, that, that you see God in the stars. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. There is not one person on this planet from the, from the newest born baby all the way to the oldest person on the planet, everybody in between. All of us see God. Even a blind person can feel God. We all have awareness. How was church? Oh, church was good today. I saw God. Yeah, but did you allow God to do what he came to do in your life after you saw him? Where's your husband? <laughs> Who you connected to? What are your relationships? Now watch this. After you see him and after you free him, God says, I want you to be like me. Amen. Because see, we got people who see him and we got people who let God do what he, what he came to do. And that's, that's where you stopped. You're just letting God do what he came to do. And you come back next week and you're going to let God do what he came to do. <laughs> and you come back and you're going to let God do what he came to do. I'm, I'm free in the point. I'm giving God access to the innermost parts of me. But there's another step. I want you to be the plug now. And that's where maturity comes in. That's where development comes in. That's where growth comes in. That's where God begins to take your ability and your passions and your gifts and your calls and the things that you are um, naturally good at and develop those skills and develop those traits in order for you to now use those to be the plug for somebody else. Now watch this. Look at the woman's life. John is very specific in his details um, the other three Gospels are the synoptic Gospels. They are the same stories told in different forms, but John goes about this a different way. He is very detailed and deliberate in his approach. Look what he says, how the woman responded. The Bible says that the woman went to town. And who did she talk to? Look what the Bible says. What did it say? Talk to the men. Hold up. Men and women ain't supposed to have dealings in public. Crash down that social bias. Crash down that cultural bias. Crash down that gender bias. The very thing that ostracized you. The very thing that society tried to put a barricade on in front of you. God can tear that down because once she became the plug, the Bible says she went to the men and said, come see a man. Yeah, I know that you had one perception of me before, but I want you to come see a man. Yeah, I know I was one way before, but I want you to come see a man. Yes, I know that I said this before, but I want you to come see see a man who told me about everything that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? And the Bible says that the men came running not to her but to him. Glory be to God. Because before, watch this, because she had five husbands and she's shacking with a man. Normally when she spoke, the men came running to her. Amen. Amen. But instead of running to her because she saw the plug, she freed the plug, and she became the plug, the Bible says that they came running to town, not for her, but came running to town for him. And so can I free you this morning? I'm going to free you this morning, then I'm going to be out of your way. What the world sees as talkative, God sees as outgoing. Glory be to God. What the world sees as a stickler, God sees as organized. What the world sees as somebody who is dramatic, you always in drama, God sees you with personality. What the world sees as skeptical, God sees you as investigative. Hashtag nosy. What God sees as, what, what the world sees as naive, God sees as optimistic. What the world sees as immature, God sees as you just like to have fun. What the world may call a jerk, God says, you know what, you're not a jerk, you're just not easily shaken. 
What God, what the world sees as extra, God sees you as passionate. What the, what the world sees as unemotional, God sees you as unmoved. What the world sees as arrogant, God sees you as confident. What I want to let you know is the thing that people ostracize you for, the thing that people say, you know what, you ain't really qualified for this position. You ain't really uh, qualified to be where God has made you be. That's the very thing that God is going to flip around and make you the plug for somebody else. I want to know, is there anybody in this room this morning who says, you know what? I'm not just going to see the plug. I'm not just going to free the plug, but I'm going to be the plug. I'm going to raise my awareness. I'm going to give God access, and then I'm going to use my ability. If that's you, jump to your feet and give God a clap in this place. Give God a shout in this place. Give God some glory in this house. See the plug. Say that. Free the plug. Say that. And finally, be the plug. Say that. Now, I don't know what level you're at this morning. Go ahead and stand to your feet all over.